how do you make sure that you get the, re the right information? Um, what we are going to do the next half hour is to look at some regulatory requirements that we have. Um, once again, we will tie back to what we have discussed uh, half an hour ago, medical diagnosis. And then I would like to go with you, walk you through the pharmacovigilance, a pharmacovigilance reviewer wildest dream. Then we will have the impact of reality <laughs> uh, and discuss also the importance of a common format. Now, in terms of regulatory requirements, regulators do not ask for very much, actually, because once you have a patient, a reporter, a reaction and a medicine, that's all you need to have a valid case. And by a patient, we do not mean um, a name, uh, date of birth, uh, address and shoe size. We just need the certainty that this person exists. A reporter, it's useful to have a name and an address because we might have want to go back to the report and ask for more information. We need a reaction and we need a medicine that has been involved. So if you are at the party and somebody says, oh Marina, you do work for the National uh, Centers in Croatia. You know, I have heard that a cousin of mine might have blah, blah, blah. This is a hearsay, okay? And this will not go into your database. So, but if you have these four elements here, this is from a regulatory point of view, a valid case and should be processed. A pharmacist reported that a male patient complained about hair loss. He was taking cotrimoxazole. We have a reporter, we have a patient, we have a reaction, and we have a drug. Is this the regulator's paradise? No. What do we do with this? Nothing. It's nonsense. Regulatory authorities will not be happy with that, even though the requirements are fulfilled. But also regulators have to assess the cases. And what do you want to assess there? You can't do it. So this report gives you a lot of work because you have to process this and to put it into your database and you have tried to follow it up and so ever, but you won't get much out of it. And this is the reason why, as pharmacovigilance center, as drug regulatory authority, we, we have to train the people we work with and tell them what we need. We have also to train industry and it's very important to work with industry because they report too. And if we train them well, they will report better and we will have better data. I told you this, ADR is a drug induced disease, does not differ significantly from the natural form and should be investigated exactly the same way. So, what do we do back to before the coffee break, if you still remember? When somebody comes with a health complaint to us as healthcare professionals, we will inquire about the patient, demographic data, how old are you, for example. We will inquire about the family history and the medi personal medical history of the patient. We will uh, ask about what is the problem right now, the health complaint. We will also inquire if the patient has already done something about it and what results were achieved. We will do a physical examination, maybe some lab tests, maybe some x-rays, whatever. And then we might come to a conclusion. This is what we have discussed an hour ago, right? This is our patient. At the National Pharmacovigilance Center or at the regional one, Patients do not show up with their complaints. We receive forms. But what we do is exactly the same thing as, we, as if we had the patient in our rooms. Because the thinking is the same and the principle is the same and what we want to achieve is the same. We want to know what is the cause of the health complaint that the patient has. So ideally, a reporting form should provide exactly the same information then a clinician would seek if the patient were in his hospital, in his rooms, or whatever. I don't see the patient, but I have, would like to have the same information on this piece of paper. 
So let's go to the pharmacovigilance reviewer's wildest dream. If we could wish, what would you like to have? I would like to know how old the patient is. I would like to know man, woman. I would like to know what ethnicity, because of pharmacogenetic differences, also because of differences in culture and in nutrition, for example, differences in recreational habits, um, height and weight. Let's allow that they cheat a little bit. But um, yes, that would be nice to know. Why? Because sometimes you have a, an inappropriate prescription of the drug and if you see the dose and if you see uh, the patient, you might be able to explain, uh, based on pharmacokinetics, what has happened. I want to know about his family history, his personal history. Are there illnesses that are in the family that could maybe influence what is happening now? And I would want to know about recreational habits. And I'm not just being curious. It's, um, I remember when I was working in the operating theater and uh, I used to go and see the patients the evening before to explain what um, this was going to happen, to examine the patient, to answer all the questions, to discuss what kind of uh, anesthetic technique we would use, because I think it's important that patients decide with you, that you can counsel. And, and then the obvious question comes, do you drink alcohol? If yes, how much do you smoke? And you have patients looking at you completely candidly saying, no, of course I don't smoke. Fine. <laughs> Next day after the surgery, you go back and say, how much did you say you smoke? Because recreational habits do interfere with our metabolism. And somebody who smokes regularly has a certain enzyme, a enzyme induction in the liver. And these people put away your anesthetic agents. You have to put them in and, like a shovel, you know, like shoveling coal in, a, in, a, in an engine. That's exactly what happens. No, they don't smoke, but you are giving and giving and giving and giving and you have a hard time keeping them asleep. So maybe the information that no, I don't smoke was not that appropriate. And this is the reason why we would like to know. Um, hepatic disorders. What is the most common used drug in the Western Hemisphere? Alcohol. Alcohol, right. Go and check the reports that you receive with hepatic disorders reported on them. And go and check how many times you will find an indication if this patient drinks alcohol or not. Because Nobody thinks of it, but it's the most important thing that you have to know. Or one of the most important things that you have to know. So, recreational habits are important. In terms of the, the adverse drug reaction, I would like an exact chronology, an exact description of the timelines of what has happened when. I would like to know if it's severe or not, and I would like to know if it's serious or not, and what's the difference between the two? Do you know? Yes, please, whoever wants to, just shout. <laughs> <laughs> severity in the sense, uh, number of eruptions or uh, this thing. Suppose if it is depends upon the number or it is extensive or it is limited to certain place like that. Mm -hmm. Seriousness is different. What because is that? of the reaction and other things where the general condition is worst or bad or uh, this thing will be assessed under seriousness. Is a fever of 40 degrees that resolves within 24 hours at home. Severe? Is it severe? Yes, yes. yes it's severe. 40 degrees fever is intense. Is it serious? No. No, why not? It's not life threatening, not causing death, hospitalization, prolonged hospitalization. Very good. <laughs> Seriousness <laughs> is a regulatory word and it relates to the outcome. Something is defined as serious if it, as Marina said, leads to hospitalization, is life-threatening, leads to death, is a permanent disability, is a congenital disability, or it's medically important. Mm -hmm. Severe is the clinical intensity of a phenomenon. So a fever, 40 degrees, that results within 24 hours and the patient can stay at home, might be severe, but it's not serious. Do you know what hexadactyly is? Babies born with six fingers instead of five. This is not severe because it's a cosmetic problem but it's serious because it's a congenital anomaly. 
So we have to distinguish between severity and seriousness, which in English is very easy because you have two words. In other languages you have only one word. In German you have schwerwiegend and schwerwiegend is both. So you never know what you're talking about. So let's be happy with these two terms. <laughs> um, I would like to know how this develops. We have mentioned rashes an hour ago and we said that most rashes are um, not severe. I'm not talking about Stevens, Johnson and Tin, but um, sometimes you have a situation which a patient needs to be treated with a drug. Let's say a uh, patient with AIDS that badly needs an antibiotic. And the bug that this patient has is responsive only to this one antibiotic that you have at your disposal. And the patient develops a rash after seven days. And you should treat him three more days. But it's really important because he has an infection and you have no alternative. You might decide to treat through the rash. I would like to have this documented. I would like to have the development document and I would like to have documented what, what have we done. Have we stopped the medication or not? And what has happened when we stopped the medication? Or have we given the drug and maybe the condition has resolved under treatment? And I would like to know what happened to the patient at the end. The colleagues that show me the, the pictures of the skin reactions that have been reported to them, my first question is what happened? Did this patient survive or not? Outcome is very important. It is very important because if we have reactions that lead to an adverse outcome, we are under a different kind of pressure to take risk minimizing action than if we have conditions that resolve without consequences. So this is my dream in terms of ADR. And then it comes to the, the very big dream, the one about the drugs. What do I want to know? I want to know the active ingredient. But I'm not happy with the, uh, the active ingredient alone. I want to know the name of the product. And why is that? First of all, we do not give active ingredients to our patients, but we give products. Secondly, a reaction can be caused by an active ingredient or by an excipient or by whatever. And thirdly, regulators, hooray, can you take action against an active ingredient? No, you can't. You have to take action against a company and against a product. Mm -hmm. So you need to know, because the first thing that happens if you have a, a very important uh, case report with a life-threatening um, ADR that is being reported, you send it to the company and say, huh, and there is only active ingredient, and they will say, can you prove that this was my product? Mm -hmm. Not really, but I think you should know. So you see, if I want to take action as a regulator against the product, I need to know who is responsible for this product. This is why this information is important. It's important to know the galenic form, it's important to know the batch, but mostly we live without batch numbers. Batch numbers are more important in uh, biologicals and uh, vaccines than in pharmaceuticals. But still, if we have something that might be linked to a quality problem, we might me, we <laughs> might want to know the batch number because we might be in a situation where we have to recall a whole batch and then we have to identify it. I'd like to know the dose that the patient has been given. I want to know the regimen, how often. I want to know the route of administration, for how long and has it been discontinued, has it been given again, what has happened. So I want to know lots of things. Now in your experience, do you get all this on your report forms? All of this? Oh, who is the happy person who lives in pharmacovigilance paradise? <laughs> because I never used to get all this. In 14 years? So this is why I say it's a dream. I would like the reporter to tell me about the findings that he had when he talked to the patient, when he examined the patient. I would like that to be described on the, la on the, on the yellow form. Yeah. <laughs> What is the reality? The reality is that our reports often lack the essential information. And one reason is that we have not been telling clearly enough what we need. And the other reason is 
lack of time, or something that we do not have to underestimate is sometimes the adverse drug reaction is reported by the person who sees the patient, but this person is not the one that has prescribed the drug. So maybe there is information lacking because the person was not involved in the treatment. And there is one thing that is very important. Following up a report is onerous and often yields poor result. So it's the first contact with the primary reporter who is of paramount importance and will yield the best result. So if you have a primary reporter on the phone, ask all you want to know. Because the chances of getting him on the phone a second time, especially if he's a busy professional somewhere, are zero or close to. So, especially for people working in industry, if they have their uh, sales representatives out, it's not enough to write down a note, Dr. So-and-so reported that one of his patients had problems, please investigate. Because the pharmacovigilance department that will have to go and investigate will not get any information, any useful information, because the doctor might not even remember what he was referring to when he was talking to the sales rep. So if we have in our national centers or regional centers, contact with our primary reporters, ask them all you want to know in the first go. What are essential data? There is the nice to have and there is the essential to have. And in my experience, the more you ask for, the less you get. So you have to decide and set your priorities. In terms of patient gender, age or age group is important. Why? Why is it that women are, seem to be more prone to adverse drug reactions than men? Is there a scientific reason or is it just that women moan more? I'd rather say that the men moan more, but that's a matter of perspective. Now, there, there is a, a, a biological explanation for this. A, hormones, because if you analyze the database, we see that up to the teenage age, the distribution, gender distribution is approximately 50-50, and then the disbalance, more women reports in the database than men starts after puberty, so there is a hormonal influence. And then there is a difference in the distribution between muscle and fat, which has an impact on pharmacokinetics. Okay? The age group is important because um, those of us who have worked or work with children a lot will come to the conclusion that the child is not just a small adult. The physiology changes very much from the moment of conception till you get into the adult age. So it's important to know where you are in order to try to work out how um, the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of a drug are in a population. I would like to know if a patient has allergies, for example, especially if we are treating allergic reactions because there are cross allergies between substances. I would like to be informed of renal or hepatic problems. They do interfere with excretion and metabolism of the drug. I would like to know about any chronic disease that is relevant, and I told you about the recreational habits of my so-called non-smokers in the operating theater. In terms of adverse drug reaction, I would like, and I never tire of repeating this, I would like a clear, detailed description of what happened. I would like the whole story. I would like to know what, what happened there. A date of onset is necessary. How did it develop and what was the outcome? <coughs> So you see the list, my dream list is shrinking <laughs> considerably. And in terms of drug, substance and product, therapy dates, dose regimen and the end rate challenge. Okay, these are the beer essentials. I would like to be able to contact the reporter. So contact details will be important. And what is also important that if we think of revising our yellow forms or changing something. Always leave a free field for any information that the reporter wants to tell you that we did not think of. There is something that was quite impressive. Um, years back when H5N1, avian flu, was an issue, uh, the regulatory authority where I was working at, the, at that point um, started worrying about a scenario of having to vaccinate the whole population of Switzerland, which is 8 million, with a vaccine that had not yet been developed. And 
during the development of a potential vaccine against avian flu, there were problems in the efficacy of these vaccines. So that the scenario at that point was that probably uh, more than one dose was needed for every person. And if you think in terms of public health, it would have meant vaccinating the whole population with more than one dose of vaccine, with a vaccine that had been shortly developed and no experience was available. Which means that you have to do what we call real-time pharmacovigilance. These are programs that have to be surveilled as the vaccination programs go on. Um, what happened then is that we started developing um, a small database um, or a reporting system that was able to cope with this situation and then H5N1 disappeared. So we stopped working on that. And one and a half year later H1N1 came on the scene. So we reactivated the whole thing. And this was an electronic reporting system for primary reporters where they ju could just log in and then report quickly what had happened to the patient. And we thought that we wanted to do them a favor and make life easy for them. And we put all sorts of pre-selected reactions in there and drop down menus and whatever. And then we put a small field for additional information. And then we had to realize that our doctors and our pharmacists did not want to tick boxes. They did not use them, but they used a the little field to tell you the story. They just wanted to talk to you and explain to you what happened and not go on your pre-selection what you thought was important. So whenever you, you work on a reporting system, whenever you revise your reporting forms, think that maybe somebody would prefer to tell you what happened and not tick boxes. So allow plenty of space for additional information or for the story to be told. Because otherwise, if you limit it to crosses and, and tick boxes, you might not get information you want. There are adverse drug reactions where you want special information, for example, for hep hepatic um, adverse drug reactions you will want to know uh, on top of what I have asked for before. Um, alcohol consumption you will want to know, uh, gallbladder problems, gallstones you will want to know about infections, you will want to know about maybe uh, some kind of viral hepatitis that the patient has had or any other illness that could affect uh, chronically the liver. So maybe for specific adverse drug reactions you, you might have specific requirements that go on top of this short list that we had before. Now, a common format. Maybe if you had a look at the, at the reporting forms, you have realized one thing, that no matter in which country you go, no matter in what language the reporting form is, we always ask for the same things. Why? Because we need the same elements to do an evaluation of an adverse drug reaction. But nowadays, um, we get lots of reports and it's good to get lots of reports but that means that we cannot work any longer with a lot of paper and people who have done it know how onerous it is to have a stack of reporting forms and have to enter everything into the database it takes a very long time and we have nowadays the electronic possibilities to exchange data from one database to the next without having to print it out, send the paper by mail, uh, open uh, the envelope and re-enter it into another system. But what is important is that pharmacovigilance is a global activity, this exchange is essential, but in order to be able to exchange we have to have compatible systems, otherwise we cannot exchange, inf exchange information. And a compatible system means that we need a common format. That means that if in my field for the patient's uh, details there is a name and a date of birth, it has to be the same in your database too. Otherwise I cannot transmit the report, it cannot be uploaded correctly. Maybe the, the date of birth will show up in the ADR field or whatever. So an automated electronics exchange is only possible if we have a common format, but this is how we will be working, we are working now already, but we will be working in the future because we cannot cope with that much paper any longer. And especially, we do not have the resources and the means to employ so many people to do a job that can be done by pushing a button. You might have heard of E2B, everybody speaks of E2B, but what is E2B? E2B is nothing else than a guideline. Yes? Something that writes to me. 
Well, you said that the, the field blank is, is giving the more information and also said that the, the, the electronic forms will be the future for the, for the information. How to, how to handle this? Because you know that the blank fields allows the people uh, put whatever say, uh, they, they want to put and then after that to, to handle all this information in an electronic way. How it does work. You can um, transfer free text fields from one da database to the other, but you need to have the same field declared as free text field in both databases. You, you, you can do that. You, you can uh, also send text back and forth. E2B is a guideline. It's a guideline issued by the uh, um, International Conference of Harmonization and it defines which fields in a database contain what kind of information. And if we adhere to this guideline and we use the data fields accordingly, then our databases will be able to talk together. So E2B is not a special report. E2B does not refer to the re reporting forms that are back there. E2B is simply the specification of data fields in a database, a guideline on how to do this. So if we talk of this is an E2B report, basically we, it's nonsense what we are saying. It's a report in an E2B format, which refers to the database in which it is in. It doesn't say anything of the report itself. This you can download from the, uh, from the internet. It defines what kind of information should be captured in specific fields in order that my database can communicate with Halmet's database, for example, which is easy because you use VigiFlow, so it goes back and forth. But it's also possible to transfer data from one national center, oh, from one regional center to the national center, from the national centers to the companies, or having the companies sending the reports directly into our database instead of receiving a piece of paper and having to type them in. Because we have to remember, every time we type in something in a database, we can make mistakes. Yeah. Besides the whole uh, workload that we have to cope with. Data quality is much better if it goes straight in, because then on both sides we will have the same information. Okay. What are key elements in these E2B guidelines? Um, the guideline defines the title and the content of each field. Uh, and it has technical specification on the data field. So how long a field can be, what values can be entered there. It defines the abbreviations for the units. So you cannot use whatever unit you want, but if you want to communicate with other databases, you will have to stick to those. Also units for time intervals, routes of administration, and lots of other things. The guideline is very, very long, and it's an absolute pain to read, except for uh, IT specialists who know exactly what is meant. But for uh, the normal um, uh, clinician or pharmacovigilance person who is not specifically interested in the background of a database, uh, it's a tedious lecture, I must say. So, to make a long story short, reporting tools, whatever you use, must be user-friendly and should not be a burden to the reporter, because otherwise people will not report. But at the other end, there is not only the, reporting, the reporter in this game, we play in this game too. And if we are supposed to evaluate adverse drug reactions, if we are supposed to draw conclusions, and to propose risk minimizing actions, and this is what our patients expect from us. They do not expect us to collect stamps, okay? They expect us to take action on identified risks. In order to do that, we need the information um, to evaluate the case. Remember the first one, the pharmacist that reports the male patient lost his hair and was under contramoxazole? This is useless. It might be user-friendly, you can put it in, in an app, but it, it's useless. So on one side there is the comfort of the reporter and the accessibility, and on the other side the needs of the, pa the person who has to evaluate this data. At the end of the day we want to be able to have sound data that allows sound decision and risk minimizing action. And this is important, harmonization of a format is a prerogative to be able to exchange data. And Pharmacovigilance is a global enterprise. So this is something that we need to consider. We have time for questions. Elke. Good, Ellen.
But um, are we, I don't know if uh, for the law you say like these minimum requirements are necessary to be a valid case, can't we oblige a little bit more elements to be a valid case because it's really, um, yeah, not efficient to, to try to find out after it's already a valid case, we have like our deadlines for sending them further but it's really sometimes difficult and s especially in certain times of year when there's a horror holidays to find the extra information mm -hmm. and it's ex it's um, yeah so. a valid case is not a a case that can be evaluated a valid valid is a regulatory term it, it means it qualifies for reporting end of the story but that a valid case can be Yes, that, go, that goes into the chapter of pharmacovi pharmacovigilance dream. <laughs> now, I, I agree with you, but um, the compromise of this minimal reporting criteria is based on the fact that pharmacovigilance is the art of dealing with imperfect data. And it's so difficult to get um, the complete information. And if we set um, the standard too high and say we want this and this and this and this and this for it to be a valid case, we will get maybe a third of what we are getting now. So one argument in favor of this is that if you have bad quality data, but a lot of it, you might be able to do something about it. But still our experience here with 8 million reports in the database show that when we do evaluate a signal at the end, we still would like to have the detailed information on the single case and often we don't have it. Yes, of course it would be nice, but um, this, is, this is the reality. And the problem is that pharmacovigilance in the international setting, in the regulatory setting, is going into a direction that is um, it's very difficult to influence. So if you read requirements, whatever country you go, it's time frames and it's format. So in the law it will, say, it will be stated within what time frames you have to report um, an adverse drug reaction and it will say in what format and who is uh, under legal obligation to report. It will never say what elements for medical evaluation that you will need in there. The consequence of this is that as this is easy to measure, when an authority goes and inspects a company, for example, the pharmacovigilance system of a company, they will focus exactly on that time frames and format because you can measure it and nobody can discuss it. If a 15 day report have be, has been reported 20 days, then that's a finding in, the uh, in your inspection. But you will not be able to start discussing if they have gathered enough medical information, one. And the second one is how can you prove as an inspector that the company would have been able to get this information and didn't do it because of negligence? Because it's so often not available. So at the end, the regulators focus on timelines and format, and the industry does exactly what the regulators want, and the medical content goes down the drain. I'm not happy about this. So we are also regulatory authorities, but we are depending on the, on the European law, and so we have also our deadlines as mm -hmm. regulatory yes. authority. At, uh, yeah. yeah. I know, but this is what every company... Yeah. I but think it's best better to have a higher quality number of reports than a higher quantity. I know everything wants to be measured. You need As both. As an assessor, <laughs> you need... Uh, yeah, okay. I would like the high quality reports too. But I can imagine when you start a new pharmacovigilance system in a country that does not have one yet, then the first thing you have to get is numbers in for different reasons, because the healthcare professionals and the patients and the consumers must get used to the idea of reporting. And you, as a pharmacovigilance center, have to justify your existence for your government, because you get the funding from your government, that you are achieving something. And at the beginning, it's numbers of report. And when you have a number 
uh, of reports that sort of guarantee a certain uh, survival within the healthcare community and within your governmental environment, then start working more on quality than on quantity. But if you start a, ph a pharmacovigilance center from scratch, where there is nothing, the first thing you will want is a number of reports. So there are both aspects. And the only way to get better reports in is to, to educate, to train the people that work with you. And to train everybody, to train industry, to train the public, to train the healthcare professionals. There is, there is no, I think there is no way past this. If you, if you see um, the most established or the, the best established pharmacovigilance systems in the world, they are old. They have been there for decades and decades. It takes a long time because reporting and not only the fact that I report, but what I report is part of, of the uh, healthcare culture of a country. And it takes several generations to, to have it really implemented. This does not happen from one day to the other. So we have to be very patient, and especially those of us who maybe work in settings that are young in terms of pharmacovigilance, you will not earn the fruit. <laughs> next generation will. But be patient and go on to enable the next generation to earn then what you have sold. Some of my difficulties during reporting is when they ask when the patient started taking the drug and sometimes the patient doesn't know and in the form they asked me the date, month and year. I think if I, I asked somebody when you started taking your antipertensive drugs, maybe they don't know even the year. So uh, for me it's very difficult to to feel that that uh, that kind of data, I'd like to ask you if it should it would be enough to say for days, for months, or for years. Mm -hmm. What matters? Yeah, if you don't have the date, which ha happens very often, mm -hmm. then it's important to give exactly the information that you have given us now. The patient has been on this drug for several years, or. Two weeks after taking, the, approximately two weeks after taking the drug, this and this happened. That's enough if you don't have the dates. But just to give some sort of time frame. So I should, su I should su suggest that my country to change the form because they ask me the complete data. They don't have a field to, to uh, free text to. Yes. They ask have a free, yeah. a free test, but they, it's uh, obligatory to uh, fill the data, they, the date. Okay. Uh, yes, ask them to change it, <laughs> or at least put uh, x x x zero 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 <laughs> so that they see that it's a, that it's a dummy date that you have put in, and then explain in the free text that you've done it. We used to have um, in the early days of VigiFlow some fields that were mandatory, and one was also about dates, the date of birth. I think at the very big ten years ago was mandatory. Uh, and then we had regional centers complaining, saying, but we don't have the date of birth of this patient, and if I cannot put something in, then I will not be able to send the report to you. And so we started um, the so-called dummy dates, a completely absurd date that everybody knows that this is impossible. Uh, date of birth, um, I don't know, the 1st of April 1789 for example, because then the assessor sees it and sees that it's absurd. And then in the free text field, you can specify date of birth unknown put in as a placeholder if you have a system that really requires that and does not allow you to go on otherwise. Unless you have a quality check then in the system that tells you that this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask about um, the brand name, the product name you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes they give the generic and then they put the company's name there. I wanted to find out if it's okay because sometimes you probe and they tell you they can't remember the brand name, but at least the health professional remembers that it's from this company mm -hmm. and the batch number is also there. So yeah. No, that's, it, that's enough it's because it's okay. you have a manufacturer so you can get back to it and no, you have the at the regulatory authority, um, you can put then the name of the product to the company, but what you need is uh, the manufacturer, so, and then you can identify the product usually. Sometimes you get a manufacturer with a batch number. The batch number is very difficult, I agree with you. Mm 
I said, if in terms of batch number, insist when you're dealing with vaccines, insist when you're dealing with biologics, and insist when you have the suspicion that a quality problem is causing the ADR. So if you get, for example, clusters of reaction, the same kind of reaction from the same area, then you might have a suspicion that something is not okay with the quality of the product, and then um, batch number is very, very useful. Then we can go to India together. Yes. yes? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Uh, please.